Okay, so we're here with... I'm Mike, I'm from DJI. Mike from DJI, all right. And I've never flown a drone before, a real drone anyway, so we're gonna kind of walk me through it real quickly and then uh, I'll give it a go. All right, so as you know, this is the Phantom 4 Pro. It's gonna have a one inch sensor. It's gonna have obstacle avoidance 360 degrees all the way around. Very easy to fly. So it has a GPS module built in, also a barometer, and that's gonna hold your altitude and your GPS location. So unless you're telling it to move, it's not going to. Right. It'll fight to maintain that exact same location, right. which makes this very easy to fly because you can think about what you want to do next. So is the automation and the ease to not crash it the biggest advancements in the past year, or is that just my assumption? Um, actually, the camera that's on there camera. is probably the biggest one. It's a, it's a one inch uh, Sony CM, CMOS sensor, mm -hmm. so it's gonna be very similar to an RX100. Right. So you're gonna have right. really nice dynamic range, crisp uh, 20 megapixel photos, and it does 4K at 60 frames per second. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you the controls, actually. Very easy to start up and take off. You're just gonna actually move that up button right there. Just tap it, slide to take off. It's gonna go ahead and start itself up. Climb to about one meter. You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Ooh, that was a close one. Welcome to the b &H Photography Podcast. Today we have in store for you a real treat. The podcast team was invited by DJI and the b &H marketing team to a special event at the historic Bathhouse Studios in Manhattan's East Village neighborhood. And we will take you with us as we fly the DJI Phantom 4 Pro and the Inspire 2 Quadcopter. And stay tuned throughout the episode as we're going to be offering a b &H Photography Podcast exclusive promotion code for a real Really nice discount on DJI Mavic propellers and on their extended protection plan for Mavic drones. We're going to start today's show with DJI spokesman Adam Lisberg and then turn to experts like Randy Scott Slavin and Parker Jokers to talk about the latest in drone technology and their personal experiences flying DJI and other platforms. We're also going to be speaking with New York Times food photographer Andrew Scrivani on his plans to incorporate drones into his work and talk with a few content creators and fellow podcasters as well. We're going to bring you parts of these conversations on today's episode, but first, be sure to subscribe and review our show on iTunes and try out the SpeakPipe widget on our landing page to leave us a voice comment that we might include in an upcoming episode. And a special shout out while we're on the topic to Jose Jimenez of Nicaragua, a longtime listener and a great fan of the show, and we love you too, my friend. Let's start our conversation with Adam Lisberg, the U.S. spokesman for DJI. Adam is here today for the DJI Inspire 2 experience. Did I get that right? It's, it's the DJI Inspire 2 and Phantom 4 Pro experience. A mouthful. It is. A mouthful. It's an experience. It that's actually the, goes that's through the part two badges. That's how long the name is. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, welcome, Adam. Thank hey, you for thanks. joining us. Glad to be here. So uh, uh, DJI has uh, been a product that we've been aware of for a long time. I, I remember I actually owned the first one. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, and I'm... They've come a long way. So why don't you tell yeah. us about what we got today? Because we've come like five generations since then. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's even aside from looking at particular model numbers and things like that, look at the evolution of drone technology. That for, The first problem that everyone had to solve, and DJI was one of the leaders in doing this, how do you spin around a bunch of propellers in different directions and have a, a, a computer, that a little computer that figures out if you spin them a little faster, a little slower, you can make it go up, you can make it go down, left, right, side, side, around, around. That was a big problem five, ten years ago, and we solved it, and other people solved it too. Um, and since then, you've seen the, the technology involved, um, the, the technological problems to solve to make the next generation of Leap, um, it, it keeps being something new. First, it was how do you get something in the air flying around, and you, you did it, and hey, it was pretty fun. You know, you could control it moving, and then people said... 
How well, do we get buildings and trees out of the way? Yeah. And, and, and you know, so, so removing all obstacles turned out not to be that productive. It was, it was a very expensive and time consuming process. They said, let's control it better. And then they said, well, wouldn't it be great to be able to see what the drone sees? You know, this is like being able to see the world like a bird. So strapped GoPro cameras onto drones. And it was an amazing view that nobody had ever seen before. And it was every bit as bumpy and, and rocky a view as you'd expect from something, you know, that's it's still a piece in its of first plastic blowing yeah. around on the wind. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, um, so the next big step was to come up with a stabilized gimbal to mount a camera on so that you would, you know, it smooths out the little bumps and moves that, that when the, when the drone says, okay, I'm about to swing left, the, the gimbal counteracts and swings right a little bit. So you get that nice smooth motion. I mean, you, you guys, if, if you're listening to this podcast, presumably you have seen drone video, you know what I'm talking about, that, that, that kind of amazing, uh, uh, you know, that, that smooth cinematic appeal to it. So we solved the gimbal problem. Mm -hmm. And then we said, you know, GoPro's, GoPro's a great camera, um, but other ways that we could optimize it for, uh, what you're going to be seeing uh, from the air and come up with cameras that are devoted to aerial use. So that was the next generation of technological problem to solve. But, you know, look, this, this is this is a really exciting space to be in because for people who enjoy flight, for people who enjoy photography, who enjoy making their videos, this is a revolutionary leap that you can, you know, you literally see the world in an entirely new way. Nobody's ever really seen the world closely from 100, 200 feet up and, and seen that kind of perspective that it puts on things. Um, and so as those creative, as that creative potential was expanding, more and more people who were facing all sorts of professional challenges out in the world said, hey, couldn't we use the same kind of technology for that? And you're seeing this profusion of enterprise uses now, whether it's uh, a surveyor, a insurance adjuster, a roofing contractor, a farmer, a, an academic studying erosion, a city that wants to be able to monitor the condition of its curbs or its riverbanks. I'll give you a good example from based on my own experience. I used to photograph boats a lot, boat to boat and from helicopters mm -hmm. at 1500 bucks an hour. I could have bought a new DJI drone for each assignment yeah. for that kind of money. In fact, even pocketed some change. So yeah. now, did, did you or anybody else at DJI ever expect it to take off, take off yeah. this big? You know, I think the visionaries always have. The, the, the people who really see the, um, the potential of what it means to be able to have a stable platform in the air that's, that's very supple and very um, uh, tightly controllable. Um, and the ability to put on all sorts of different kinds of imaging sensors, you know, that might've been their wildest dreams, but yeah, some of the, the real far visionaries could have imagined it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I constantly find myself telling people, not only is this going to change everything, not only are you going to be used to seeing lots of drones in the air five or 10 years from now, it's already changing everything now. Oh yeah. You know, you look at the, the this is really the year going to be the year that enterprise uses take off, especially that it's going from, you know, if you're a business that can benefit from an aerial perspective to monitor the size of your, of your, uh, the, the, the supply piles that are sitting there at your job site, or you need to measure the progress or whatever, you know, a year or two ago, if you were going to be the drone guy at that company, you probably were a hobbyist who had an interest in it anyway, and you were okay with a soldering iron and you didn't mind firmware updates. Um, and you were ahead of your competitors. Now, all your competitors are buying off-the-shelf uh, drone software packages that let you launch, control a drone, and work with the image data or the, the non-image data in some cases that you capture, um, you know, if you're using a, our, our FLIR camera, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, more and more people are, are recognizing what they can do. It's becoming a normal part of business operations. And we're, we're reaching the point this year where if you're not using a drone in an enterprise that can really benefit from a drone, then you're falling behind. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's actually its own category of cameras already. No, from yeah. from B&H's perspective, it, I don't think we ever expected that to happen, but it did. Um, Camera technology is developed at a certain pace. The big thing uh, with digital is how it, it, it's, it's either megapixels or it's ISO uh, sensitivity ratings or image stabilization. Thing. What are some of the goals that you guys are working on right now? You, you, ha you have a great product. What are some of the challenges that you're facing right now? What are some of the more some of the buggy things that you want to get at or improvements you want to build into it? Yeah, I, you know, we're we're responding to what we hear from from our market. Um, you know, it's interesting you bring up megapixels because 
you know, 10 years ago, megapixel was the big bet. Oh, I've got a six megapixel. I've got an eight megapixel camera. Oh yeah. And eventually- You should have seen me strutting with oh, that 12 meg. Yeah, oh man, yeah. I was the biggest guy in the block. But then you get you, you get beyond 12 and you know, there's yeah, no difference. That's right. You especially know, if you're shooting for the web. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, and you know, you'd have to be a, a really glossy magazine to be able to 12, tell the difference between 12 and anything above yes. it. Yes. You know, um, and so in the same way that that kind of that megapixels kind of became superfluous after a while mm -hmm. i think you know the basics all, all the drone cameras work pretty well like, yeah that's a secret for you <laughs> um but at the same time if you are doing professional imaging we recognize that there's uh there's a real demand for um for a much wider uh exposure range and in certain cases actually more for industrial uses than for um, than for general photographic uses, um, we're hearing a lot of demand for a tight zoom. So our, our Z30 camera, which gives you up to 30 times zoom, um, only has a 12 megapixels um, uh, in, in in its output. But if you're doing a power line inspection, for example, you don't necessarily need to capture you know beautiful uh, tonal gradations on somebody's skin. So you know, but you're talking about what kind of camera features people are are looking for. The two drones that we have on display at our experience here today are mm -hmm. the Phantom 4 Pro right. and the Inspire 2, and they're both designed for professional imagers in mind. The Phantom 4 Pro, it has, it, it looks from the outside very similar to the exist, the regular Phantom 4, but it has a one-inch sensor inside its camera. The it's, Sony sensor. Yeah. The killer sensor. Yeah, it, it really is. You know, you get an extra couple of stops. Um, it might be technically one point something, but you, you have a much wider range. Uh, one of the demo videos that you can just see on our YouTube page shows how you can use it to photograph a red hot lava coming out of a uh, out of a volcano in Hawaii at dusk and you know the, the the tonal range just in one of those frames is incredible the other advantage of that camera has uh, is a mechanical shutter so if you're in high movement situations, if you're photographing, uh, you know, I mean, you're, you're familiar with the shutter roll problem. Oh, yeah, Doesn't yeah, happen yeah, with yeah, the mechanical yeah, yeah, shutter right. here. And then the Inspire 2, which is really designed for video creators in mind. Um, you know, you, you could film a feature film on it. We did, in fact. Um, it's also great for live streaming for TV productions. You know, you could use it in broadcast TV. Um, it has an entirely new camera, um, the a series of camera, the X5S, and it is... Uh, one of the first things you notice on it is it has two cameras on it. One is the the main high sensor camera, and the other is a small first person view camera from uh, just shooting directly from the front of the drone at all times. So your camera operator can focus entirely on the video image and making it beautiful without having to worry about looking where he's flying. The uh, pilot yes. standing next to the camera operator is looking through the first person view camera, is able to look for obstacles, can swing the drone around while keeping the, the video camera focused on the scene. Um, you got a navigator. Yeah, yeah, essentially that's you exactly do. exactly what yeah, it is. Yeah, so you have full control from these two people. Um, so, you know, that's another example of how we listen to what our customers want to create some imaging that, that looks great. Fantastic. What's the oddest application you've ever seen for a drone? Something that said, I never thought about that. That's awesome. You know, it's funny that you think it because, it, you know, I'm sure that Steve Jobs, at the end of his life, he had apps on his iPhone that he never <laughs> would have imagined. And, and we're seeing the same True. thing every single, you know, we subscribe to news clipping services every single day. We read about somebody doing something with a drone that we never imagined. I think the most interesting one we've seen, something called Snotbot. It is these marine biologists who, how do you measure the health of a whale? You see what's coming out. You, the, the easiest for the whale is to look at what it exhales from its blowhole because it's just drenched with the animal's DNA, literally. That's right, yeah. yeah. And um, you, know, you can tell, is it male, female, pregnant, hurting, stress hormones, that sort of thing. How do you get that out of the whale without harming the whale? You fly behind it with a Petri dish mounted on top of the drone. It surfaces, exhales, splashes the drone with whale snot, Fly the drone back to the lab. <laughs> boom! You got to yeah, it, and it is fantastic and make, it makes beautiful pictures. And it's just an, you know another great example of how you can do something with this technology that I'm sure our inventors never imagined. Awesome, that's great, Adam Lisberg. Thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Randy Scott Slavin has been a guest on our show, and we welcome him back to speak on general improvements in drone technologies over the past year. Here's Randy. You were actually on our one and only previous drone show, which went over very well in early, one of our earliest podcasts. And it's good to see you again. Good to see you again. What are some of the things you could do today with the drones that we're now seeing that you couldn't do last time we spoke? It's been really, really crazy 
past year. You know what I mean? The technology has just been skyrocketing. I actually need to go back because I remember us having a very detailed description about where things were at that particular point. I remember talking about the Inspire One and that was before the Inspire One. That was the X3 when the X3 came out. Um, so it still it's, had the rubber bands. You had to like back wind them and it only flew for like seven seconds. Yeah, you know, right? exactly. <laughs> With paper p- propellers That's and whatnot. It, yes. <laughs> so, um, okay. So to answer your question in short, over the past year, I've been very busy with all kinds of aerial cinematography. Um, is shooting. that your exclusive domain right now? Do you, do you no, shoot stills? Or I'm, a, you... I'm a director by trade. So, I mean, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a creative. I, okay. I like just making things, period. Gotcha. My long-term love and my, what I will do till the day that I die is make, uh, motion pictures of sort, right? So it's like, whether it's short films, whether it's uh, music videos, whether it's commercials, uh, branded content, all kinds of things like that. That's what I've always done. And that's frankly what I just love doing. Um, and you know, that will continue to progress. Knock wood. Um, aerial cinematography came into my life because I saw a shot in a skateboard video called pretty sweet that was directed by Ty Evans, who was you know, I mean, he's he's legendary skateboard film director, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and he is actually one of our jurors this year. He is going to be coming to uh, New York to teach a class and also give a keynote about creativity. So a lot of really exciting things. I'll talk about the, remind me to get into the film I festival will. this year. Yes. I've spent a lot of time, you know, uh, being, a, being a drone uh, guy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I fly a lot of drones for TV and commercials and things like that. I find it super fun. It's a very interesting kind of counterpoint to my directing career because I don't have to like have all the responsibility of being a director. I just go in there, I put my toys together, I fly them around. Everybody on set is completely amazed. They love it. They freak out and then I leave and it's awesome. <laughs> uh, on the other side, we deal with the Drone Film Festival. This year is our third year. It's taking place on March 18th and 19th at the Liberty Science Center on the second day and on the first day at the Skirball Center at NYU. Moved into a theater double the size. Really, really exciting. We did a tech screening today. It's going to look amazing. Remember that these films, for the most part, don't get a chance to really be seen on the, on the big screen. And that's something that is really amazing about the Drone Film Festival. Can Aside I ask from about the fact that, really that quick, how, how are things, I mean, in that sense, are they, is there problems that when you throw them on the big screen? Because most people do see them on a monitor. Uh, I mean, look, sensor technology is really amazing. Even, you know, there's many, many, many films that were submitted uh, that were shot on Phantom. Mm-hmm. Phantom 4, Phantom 4 Pro, you know, I mean, the sensor technology looks really good. Like any other camera platform in general, terrestrial or aerial, it's really more about the camera operator. This year, we are sponsored by Freefly and RED. We have um, a lot of films that are shot on those. I mean, they were selected. They weren't, didn't have to do with our sponsorship. But, you know, when you have something shot on a RED or on a larger sensor format, it's going to look better when you blow it up. It's going to look better in general. You have better lenses and all that stuff. Uh, that being said, it's mostly about content. It's mostly about storytelling. It's mostly about the quality of film, period. If we're not progressing in our storytelling, then these are just like little toys that we have that we're flying around for fun. And while that's nice, it's not going to be as impactful as really using them and really pushing this whole thing to the next level. Great. So what do you think about the new the new DJIs that are here? Have you tried them yet? I mean, have you, I, uh, I haven't flown the um, the Phantom 4 Pro but the specs look out of control. I mean, the fact that they have that the the thousand nit uh, screen that's attached to it is awesome. I um, have been flying Phantoms since day one, since they first came out, um, and you know, putting the the what is it H four two D and then the H four three D. I mean, like you know, it's like I've been playing around with them forever, and they've gotten better and better. The sensors are getting bigger. The dynamic range is better. Mechanical shutter able to record on board. I mean, they're have, amazing have the, platforms. Uh, have the, is the photographic specs getting better or the control specs or both? Or what, what's, what's a big leap both. in this generation? I mean, both, yeah. absolutely. I mean, their flight control specs have gotten amazing. You know, I mean, like these things can fly themselves, land themselves, take off, avoid obstacles, things like that. Um, for me personally, you know, it's like I've been flying drones for so long and I fly a lot of drones that are, that I build a lot of racing drones. So for me, you know, sometimes I get a little bit tripped up when there's too much automation because I want to fly it. You know, I want to see what it's like. I don't want too much computer, you know, um, kind of involvement. But that being said, for most people, 99% of the people that fly, they want that and they want to make sure that they're, that it's, that they're careful. Now, is that the trend? Would you say this over the past year of things getting 
easier, user friendly, oh, definitely. more automated. Definitely. Okay. I mean, like you know, I mean, I have the, I have a Mavic, I have the Inspire One Pro uh, X5, I have the X3, I have the uh, Inspire Two. Uh, you know, I mean, the Mavic is amazing. It's literally, it's a, it's it's a Mavic. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's. Um, and what about vertical shooting on that? I was reading something about that, that now you can do that and you couldn't prior. Is that true? Yeah, you can shoot vertically uh, for those that people that, that like that. Well, Many just, people in the filmmaking community find that completely gauche, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's a whole new world out there. <laughs> well, photographers are talking about stitching things together to make panorama shots from, right. from, from right. way up. So. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I think the Inspire 2, as the Inspire 1, even the X3 was, is a real game changer. It's, it's, it's so much power and so much flight time and so much imaging capabilities and so much flight control. And, you know, I mean, the battery heaters, the, um, the, the recording codecs, I mean, the fact that you have ProRes on there and you have cinema DNG huge. I mean, just like the, the amount of, um, of, uh, dynamic range, interchangeable lenses. Yeah. Did I mention heated batteries? I mean, yeah. you know, it's like yeah. winter time. Yeah. It's like heated yeah. batteries. Yeah. It's huge. Awesome. I mean, it's like how often are we spending right. times like, you know, you're, you're putting 10 batteries in your jacket to try to keep them warm when you're in the field. I mean, that that's a thing of the past. Um, of course, the biggest game changer with this particular model, I don't mean game changer in the world, game changer within the uh, DJI ecosystem is the pilot cam for the Inspire 2. It's like, you know, if you're flying professional aerial cinematography, you're using a multi-person crew straight up. And if your pilot has the ability to use that pilot cam, which they do now in that Inspire 2, it's totally different. I mean, then you don't have somebody, you know, I can't tell you how many times with the Inspire 1 X5 and the Inspire 1 X3 where you're working with a crew, or you're looking, or your, your pilot is flying, but like all of a sudden they're like, hey, I need you to give me the camera. I need you to give me the camera. You're in the middle of a shot and they need the camera because they need to figure out how to orient themselves. You know, once you fly at 30 feet away from yourself, you can't tell where it is, how, how far it is, how close it is to anything else. The pilot camera is such a big deal and it's going to really enable um, creativity in the neck, you know, because the pilot doesn't need to worry about you and where you're aiming the gimbal. And that to me is like most important so many other amazing things about it, but that to me is like two thumbs up. What do you, what do you consider a big challenge still? I mean, I, I, we've made a lot of amazing advances, but what are some of the things that still get you nuts about that you wish you had a better, more control over? I mean, for me, I think I remember mentioning to you guys last time that it was a pilot camera on the Inspire, on the Inspire 1. So that's answered now. And people were doing it, and that's answered. Right. So, I mean, I think the biggest hurdle now is not, is not machine. The biggest hurdle now is, is human, meaning that like, you know, we need to get better pilots. We need to be training pilots. And that's what the film festival will really aim to do at the film festivals, train pilots better, get them used to what, what kind of things they need to do in order to get their skills up. What do they need to do as aerial cinematographers? I mean, you have people that submit films that they shoot in the middle of the day. And it's like, you know, I mean, how good can your light possibly be? Camera dorks around the world, please tell me. I mean, it's like you can't get that great an image in the middle of the day unless you're shooting a very particular type of shot and you need that particular thing. But it's the awareness. It's, it's people's awareness about where light is, how light happens, how to, how to use it, how to best, um, you know, how to be patient when it comes to certain landscapes. I mean, the basic rules of photography. Basic rules of photography. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, except it's, now you're... The camera's flying. That's the difference. Right. And I mean, like, there are definitely a lot more kind of onboard functions to help people getting, get to be better at being pilots or at least not crashing into things. But I think, you know, from what I see with the film festival, you know, we had almost 400 submissions this year. We're going to play 32. Okay. Wow. And okay. so, you know, what really differentiates those that are okay, those that are good, those that are great, and those that are shown? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that it's so minuscule sometimes, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's just like one shot that they put in that has some jello in it. And to me, that's like, you know, for me as a filmmaker, years, years long, almost 20 years, that's like an edit problem. You didn't see that in your edit, you know, yeah. you yeah. have to know how to cut it. You know I mean? If sometimes, you know, the rules for the film festival are five minutes or less, but like if you're shooting a five minute landscape film, no matter how interesting it is. It's too After long. After 12 seconds, yeah, okay, I right. got it. Right, I mean, it. like, yeah. you need to, so, you know, it, it's all those things. And that's why this year we're really focusing on, on, you know, theory, edit theory, storytelling, things like that. Because, okay, now we have the tools. And then, okay, you know, now anybody can do it. Anybody can fly. You pick up a Phantom 4 Pro. It's not that expensive. You pick up a Mavic. Awesome, you're in the air. But, you know, it's like, 
getting a good image is not guaranteed when you do that. It has the capability of doing it now. Mechanical shutter, huge one inch sensor, all that stuff. It's, it's, it's you know, I mean, it's, it's nearly um, idiot proof, but now the only idiocy lies in the ability to use a camera. But that's a really difficult one. You know, I've always said aerial cinematography is an unbelievably difficult sport. You know, I, I, I mean, it, it requires mastery of many different uh, disparate skills. So we've been very DJI centric, obviously, in this uh, conversation and the whole presentation. Um, what about other companies? Are there any other companies worth mentioning? Any other products out there that uh, caught your eye? So it, it depends what, what realm you're talking about. Uh, you know, really, DJI is in a class by itself, and they're not a sponsor of the film festival this year, at least not yet. Um, so I'm not saying that, you know, as, uh, you know, this is something, by the way, that, like, I have to be careful about, and I'm going to disclose who are sponsors and who are not, but, you know, I don't BS the audience uh, in general, because I speak to a lot of people. So it's like what I think personally as a, as a filmmaker and an aerial cinematography guy, these are my thoughts. Um, unique has the Typhoon H, which is a, a hexacopter. I think that's really interesting platform. Um, that is definitely like in the realm of phantom. The sensor on that, frankly, from what I've seen is not really that great. Um, but I think the platform looks really good. It has some interesting aspects to it. And from a safety, uh, from a safety um, angle, it's, it's quite good um, because the six rotors allows one to go down and then it can have a controlled descent, which I think is really important. If you slam a phantom into uh, a tree or hit a ghost branch or something, which at these days I think it will probably see, it's, it's falling, you know? That was my experience with the generation one. Yes, as soon as you hit something, it falls. But look, I mean, you know, it's like, what do you expect? It's a flying camera. You put it up in the air, they crash, that's it. You know, it's like you fly drones, they crash. That's an understanding. Um, so that, that, you know, then there was the, the Chroma 4K by Horizon Hobby, which is pretty much like out of the game. I'm pretty sure they're not making it anymore or they're phasing it out because they're more focused on drone racing. Um, that was definitely like a phantom competitor. I still fly mine, uh, you know, here and there. I, I don't, I don't mind it. Um, but frankly, because I've been really into racing drones recently and building my own, I don't really fly aerial cinematography rigs for pleasure. Like I used to fly my phantom all the time for fun, but because I fly racing drones now, FPV, it's like, it's, it's like driving a school bus, but for aerial cinematography, it's great. But yeah, the, the t racing uh, uh, drones has come up a few times in conversation here. What are the differences between racing drones and the ones that we're all seeing here today uh, that most photographers are familiar with? Oh, What's look, the racing drones are, are home-built. Uh, I mean, you can buy some, some ones that are ready to fly, but the ones that I deal with, uh, my buddy Andy Shen is literally the best racing, drone, uh, racing frame designer in the world, uh, carried by B&H, actually. Um, and I've always kind of flown his frames. They're really, really awesome. He's, like, he's a true innovator in every way. Uh, is, it, is it like a slalom course or like, how do you do it? It depends. You fly however you want, however the course is set up. I mean, I really fly more kind of freestyle. I go to a park, I fly out however I want. I do flips. I pretend I'm a bird and I just kind of sail in any direction. You have fun. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> um, but I want to go back to the other platforms for a second because I, I, you know, uh, two sponsors that we do have this year are Free Fly Systems and Free Fly Systems, you know, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt anywhere in the industry at all about their excellence. They came out the Movi, they have the Alta 6 and 8, Movi Pro recently. I mean, like their, their uh, record in terms of products is sterling. For pros out there that are really going for big time aerial cinematography, you fly a Red, you fly an Airy, something like that. I mean, it's, it's hard to beat that, that kind of platform. You know, their Synapse flight controller is amazing. They, are, they, they have just a, a sterling record and everybody that flies them has always been amazing. I've heard a lot of people flying a lot of different um, possibilities. Another sponsor of our film festival that is also top of their game is Griffin Dynamics. They build sturdy frames that are huge. You know, the difference between Griffin Dynamics, although they are coming out with something that's a little bit more ready to fly where you can buy it in its complete package, is Griffin is typically made frames. And what's awesome about that is that if you want to build a drone that is different than the normal stock, like what an Alta 8 or an Alta 6 can do, Griffin is the right way to go because you know, they have amazing frame systems. They have these frames that are just monster. I mean, like dodeca copters. I mean, I don't even know what they're called. Like, you know, counter-rotating dodeca copters that can carry like, you know, like Casey Neistat. I'm pretty sure he um, was being flown on a, on a Griffin frame when he was doing uh, his last like holiday stunt. 
Um, so, you know, it's like, I, I, but I think as far as DJI goes, DJI products are really in a class of their own because there's no other competition for the Inspire series. Not at all. Uh, there are other drones that are around in the, um, I, I know Autel makes a drone that's similar to the Phantom, but I haven't really tried it. So, I mean, you know, it's like in, in DJI's world, no, there's no competition. They really, especially the Inspire series, the Inspire 2 is just out of control. The okay. power and the grace and the abilities that it has and the pilot cams and the, I mean, it's just, what can you do? Interchangeable micro four thirds lenses. It's like, you know, I mean, I definitely need to go back to last year's podcast and think about what we were talking. Cause I remember <laughs> having this excited conversation with you guys about the Inspire one, but like that was the X3, you know, and the X5 came out and then, I mean, this now, forget it. It's, it's, okay. Randy Scott Slavin, it's great seeing you again. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Thanks for having me. I, I hope you guys come to the festival. I'll oh, send you guys we'll some tickets. There. Okay. Awesome. Food photography may not be the first thing you think about when you talk about drones, but Andrew Scrivani is always interested in pushing boundaries when it comes to his work, whether it be in stills or video photography. Let's hear how he's thinking of incorporating drones into his workflow. Andrew Scrivani photographer does a lot of work the New York Times a lot of food stuff and Andrew is has been incorporating drones into his work now is that correct well what we're right now currently we're uh, we're planning a spot that we want to execute that will incorporate some uh, drone work outdoors so essentially without giving away the entire storyboard we're talking about an outdoor picnic scene uh -huh. and we want to show the picnic from the perspective of a flying bug I was just going to say from flies. I was, it was in my head, and then you said it. Right, <laughs> okay. right. So, like, your, your bumblebee or whatever is the unw uh, unwelcomed guest at your picnic. Yellow, so, yellow jacks. Yellow, huh? Yes, absolutely. Bumblebees are good. Yellow jacks. Right. Anything that's going to sting you. <laughs> so, knowing that, especially these new drone systems that we were watching downstairs, you can fly them in through windows. You can, you know, catch them and, and transition them into a different shot where you're using them in, in unconventional ways, not just flying above and catching these giant landscape shots, but, It used know, to be if you flew, flew through a window, you'd have to have breakaway walls. So as soon as the camera went through, it would just pull the set away. <laughs> now you just fly through the window. Now you just fly through the window. So there's, there's all these options now of making shots that are organic in the food space that feel, and, and we're talking about making something funny here. You know, uh -huh, we want to uh -huh. do something clever and, and unique, not, but also be able to finish on a beauty shot at table level with a drone. I mean, that's, you know, we're talking about that's next level stuff. Oh, yeah. You know? So um, to be able to make shots like that and show those in, in, in a, you know, in a commercial reel and having people scratching their heads going, how did he make that shot? That's the whole game. Right? That's right. That's the whole game nowadays is making that shot that nobody else knows how to make. That's so, always been the absolutely. goal. Absolutely. And you milk it as long as you can before everybody else figures out how to do it and then you move on to the next trick. Right. That's it. That's it. And uh, using the technology that's available to us uh, to be able to make things that I mean, no one else is thinking of yet. You know, I mean, I don't... Clearly, everybody can do the shot where it starts on the barbecue and goes up a thousand feet and you're looking down at this giant, you know barbecue from from above but the the drone as the character in in the shot is really where i want to go I, I want the drone to actually be the character in in the spot prior to this do you have any kind of cinema experience do you work in cinema at all are you still only still photographer oh no i've been directing commercials now for the last okay. two years okay so um my experience in film kind of was born out of my photography career yeah where then I was approached by a production company and asked me if I were, was interested in shooting more video and being and being not behind the camera but you know directing the vision of the camera so they I was signed as a as a director by a production company a couple of years ago I'm assuming you didn't hesitate too long before saying sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of negotiation um, but it was interesting you know because it was a new format for me but it wasn't like I was completely a novice in film. My wife is a film producer, so oh, okay. Um, I had it's been part of the language. It's for part you. of the language. It's part of the, the nature of our home. We talk this about these things all the time. We help each other with our, with our projects. Do you have dramatic lighting all over the house? Yes, oh. everything. <laughs> drop shadows and and dramatic looks. Up lighting in every corner. Um, you know, but that's all. You know, it's just 
You know, my you know my wife gets out of bed in the morning, and the and the we have a wind machine that blows the curtains through. <laughs> you too? Yes, of course. You know, we 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 like to produce our lives. <laughs> so, is it safe to assume that? with your new interest in drones and with this food project that you have other things cooking in your head as well? Oh, sure. I mean, I, 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 I've been attempting things that mm, I don't know that anyone else has been trying in food and to some successes and to some monumental failures. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to do something that I haven't seen before. And uh, because I don't come from a traditional film background, I don't feel constrained. It's the same way I started my photography career. I did not start as traditional with a traditional photography education. I certainly didn't learn anything about food photography when I learned about cameras, and I learned it as I went. I just said, I want to see this, and I'm going to figure out how to make that shot. And over time, that became my style. So I'm kind of re retracing my steps in film now, and I'm trying to make shots that I want to see. Whether or not they exist or not, I don't know, but I'll figure it out along the way. I think I it's one of the coolest things about the drones is that it's forcing creative types to really push the limits because we're not grounded, I hate this, <laughs> figuratively and yeah, literally, sure, as far as what's possible. It seems like just about anything is now possible. I look at all new media that's out, right? Whether it's film or television or commercials, and I notice how much aerial photography is happening, and I'm saying, boy, they put a lot of helicopter pilots out of business. Yes, you know, because that was a stock and trade. But you also, you didn't make that shot in every television show or in every commercial, but now everybody's making that shot because they can. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the challenge, right? Is it's, to do that kind of a shot um, and do it well and be able to re execute it with, on a lower budget, that's amazing. Okay, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Great talking with you. Pleasure. Sarah Dietschy, Rhymes with Peachy, who recently skated through the B&H Superstore, joins us next along with Craig Adams and Ollie Ritchie. What is the relationship between you guys? We're all married. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. a very cool. 2017. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, we are all internet friends. And so okay. we all do YouTube and Instagram. Um, and we are content creators, fellow content creators. All right, here we go. Another chapter of our episode. We're being joined by Sarah Dietschy and Craig Adams and Ollie Ritchie. And if they look familiar to you, of course, they're not going to look familiar because this is an audio podcast. You can't see them. But trust me, if you went to the B&H website and you saw a picture of a whole bunch of juvenile delinquents going around on <laughs> oh, skateboards slap. in the B&H Superstore after hours, <laughs> yeah. We have them here. The police are on their way. I'm supposed to just keep them busy until the cops arrive. Anyway, welcome. So what are you guys doing with, uh, I, I know you're on skateboards and you got cameras in your hands. Are you guys going to be using uh, uh, drones as well? Are you incorporating this into your work? Have you, or are you planning on yeah, it? Yeah, we actually all have DJI Mavics. Um, okay. And so that was actually a recent purchase of mine. Um, I love it. It's so easy to fly, and because it is so small, it's really good for like what we do in terms of vlogging and stuff, because you can just throw it in your backpack and just get the shots whenever, and it's very portable, and you can just do it, right? Because both of you guys have a Mavic, yeah. right? Yes, I do. I have a Mavic, and I had a P4, and I had a P3 Pro before that, so... Whoa. <laughs> Craig ah. with a K. Mm. All of the drones. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. I'm like, yeah, I'm collecting them. I'm trying to get all of them. <laughs> so are, are you, do you all have a lot of experience flying drones? I mean, Craig, you obviously have this. You're on your third or so. <laughs> what, Ollie, what, I've, what I've about crashed you a drone. Yes. Uh, I've crashed a few myself. That's yeah. why I kind of stay away from it. <laughs> but um, no, the, the, I crashed the original versions, which were designed to crash. That right. was actually their purpose. And they're a lot better now. Now they actually work. So um, <laughs> what kind of projects are you guys working on so I, when you're not skateboarding through B&H? <laughs> um, so I actually do a lot on YouTube. I do vlogging, um, but I also have some creative shows like Creative Space TV and that Creative Life. And they kind of look at um, creative lives and they show behind the scenes of filmmakers, photographers, graphic designers. And so, yeah, just whether it's vlogging or highlighting other creatives, I just try to do all of the things. Um, so it's fun. YouTube is great. 
Yeah, so I will go on trips that That's are... That's Craig with a case talking now. Oh, I just want to keep this straight. Stop. Here we go. So <laughs> I, I will go on trips with just drone footage in mind. So just traveling all the way to Alaska with my brother in a car, you know, I would bug him. I want to stop. I want to stop. I'd see something cool, and then we'd get that shot. Um, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to getting a new drone and uh, doing that for the next one because I'm going to Utah in a couple months. Uh-huh. Utah? What are you doing in Utah? Hiking with my bro. Yes. <laughs> I'm stoked so I'm about to go skiing in Jackson Hole um, and so there's constantly a ton of people always like skiing on the mountains so I'm kind of scared with taking a drone on the slopes but that's going to be some amazing shots um, and I've only flown it in the city and in Belize so it's very new to me I've only had it for about three weeks um, so I'm excited about that are you a skier, snowboarder? So I'm a skier, but I might just try snowboarding, man. Are you going to ski and drone oh my gosh, at the same I don't time? Think so. I know try you have to. Try you have to. I have to I try it. I'll try it. Okay, guys, make sure to follow me on youtube.com slash mm, Here you go. <laughs> to see if I die while droning and skiing. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be soft. Snow is okay. If yeah, you fall, that's okay. Exactly. It's the other people I'm most concerned about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sarah, Craig, and Ollie, thank you so much for joining us again today. And uh, good Next up, we speak with YouTube educator Roberto Blake about his first experience flying a drone. You know, it's, it's so funny. It's, but like the great thing about technology and like even what we're seeing with DJI is that technology gives us the opportunity to address things that we've always done, but Mm -hmm. in a new way. Like being an online educator in the YouTube space basically is just another platform. That means that I've been able to scale and reach tens of thousands of people to teach them even one thing in a way that I could never do if I was limited to a physical venue. And so I love that. And that's part of why I'm here today, looking at what this can do with video capabilities and helping people uh, understand and see just another part of the world or learn about something in a new way because of what the technology allows for. Cool. Now, safe to assume that when you entered this these hallowed holes th- earlier, okay, you were a drone virgin. You That's had right. no experience. Tell us about it. What, what, what are your impressions of that? I mean, you, you had a chance, you, you had the controls, and you flew the darn thing. Oh, yeah. Talk to me about it. It was smooth. It was a great ride. Uh, it was gentle with me. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I was really impressed. Uh, I was really impressed. I was really wowed. The, the controller for me is like, I was surprised by the build quality because of how it looked uh, plasticky, but the build quality was great. The weight to it was pretty substantial. What about maneuverability? The did, man- it, did, that, did the drone do what you were hoping it was going to do when you Yes, hit the it was actually more responsive than I thought it was going to be. Uh-huh. So I had to calibrate for that, but it was very responsive. It was very smooth. It was very flexible and maneuverable. I love what they told me about the features, the obstacle avoidance, and I'm looking at that improving in the future as well. Um, and it's something that I think is going to be much more important going forward for people who want to do this in a uh, very hectic environments. So I, I just thought it was a fantastic experience. It performed above my expectations. It was easy to use. I thought that I would be intimidated by the complexity, uh, especially someone who's never used it. But I felt comfortable. I was ready to like go for another 20 minutes if they would have let me. Um, <laughs> And it was just an amazing overall fun user experience. It wasn't intimidating at all. And I feel like I was immediately thinking about ways that I could use this commercially and professionally and what it can do for me. And I was really impressed by it. Yeah, it's a whole new world. And the creative possibilities are pretty spectacular. It felt so natural. That's the thing about it. It felt natural. I felt more in control of this drone than I have with radio RC cars, you know, the the radio control cars. I felt much more in control of this drone than those. And I've like actually like just as a hobby kind of thing, I've messed around with a lot of those before. And this just felt much much more comfortable and easier to use and to feel like I had a sense of control over where it was going, what it was doing, and how fast. And I, I just think that was fantastic. I was really surprised more than anything. Have Do you have any kind of creative things going on in your head already based on just your experience of flying one out the door here a few minutes ago? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, for one thing, like commercially, I think for people doing local business, that yeah. if they could actually get their hands on this, even if it's the um, an entry-level model, that it would actually be very impressive for them for their video marketing, for doing Facebook ads mm-hmm. that are local, you know, marketed and targeted because it's just going to be so much more impressive and so much more unique 
of a thing that will make you remember and pay attention to that business because your competitor isn't going to go and spend $600 on going out and getting a drone and then put together something really interesting or fun or nice about the business like you know every two weeks or once a month and put it out on the internet. And I think that if you do creative things like that, it makes people pay attention to your business. Your business doesn't have to have anything to do with drones or aerial. If you're if you're a car salesman, I would use this and get a shot of the inventory of the lot. If you're if you're uh, somebody who is a, a personal or professional trainer, I would have a friend pilot this and have them follow you doing a run and then edit together like a commercial or something like that. So for for clients like mine that are doing you know online marketing for their business using video. I immediately am seeing all these possibilities that drone video production opens up for them. Anything else you want to throw in there? Uh, I would just encourage people that if you haven't, you know, had a chance to play with one of these uh, and you happen to be in like the New York or tri-state area, I would say come out to b and use the drone cage and at least get a hands-on experience with it. Or if you have a friend who has a drone, ask them politely if you could play <laughs> with it for, you know, just a few minutes. Uh, because I think you'll find that it's not as intimidating as you think. I think your brain will start like you know turning with ideas and possibilities of things you could do with it. And I just think we're living in a very exciting time right now. So I would encourage people to go out there, try to create something as awesome as they possibly can, and take advantage of all these new toys that we have to do it with. Now, if folks out there want to see your work, where should they look? Uh, you guys can find me over at robertoblake.com if you want to work with me. Uh, if you want to check out my YouTube channel for creative online education, whether you're a designer, photographer, or filmmaker, I've got a lot of great stuff for you. You can go to youtube.com slash robertoblake2, like the number two. Thank you so much for joining us, Roberto. It's great. Thank you for having me. Okay. Podcasters Chris Barrow and Amir Zanozzi are up next. We are the co-hosts of a podcast called Five Favorites, which is part of the Why I Social podcast. And uh, we both have our own other jobs. Those are That's where we interconnect, though, in, in the podcast world. Wow, interesting. You got to check that out. Okay. And you guys are also drone pilots. Is that correct? Or, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, you, 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 oh, I just, said, oh yeah. yeah. I just recently crashed my Phantom 4. Oh, tell but, us about it. <laughs> oh, man. It was, uh, it was heartbreaking. <laughs> Being here is a little bittersweet because uh, I, I see these nice... Nice new Phantom 4 Pros. But no, I mean, there's no better drone than DJI. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've flown a couple drones here and there, and um, even crashing it, it was just like an awesome experience. <laughs> You're just like, I want to crash it again. And I looked at my bank account, I was like, I can't crash it again. <laughs> By the way, you know, I think we have to qualify this. People are going to be listening and say, oh, they crash. They're not pre- listen, if you have a still camera, I guarantee if you're listening to this, you've dropped it, okay? So if you things have break. something, things, things break. break. If things are floating in the air, yeah. they will using them once in a while. It happens. Occupational hazard. That, that, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, I mean, it, it, you, you can, you could, well, I'm not going to say that, but <laughs> <laughs> you can be impaired and uh, fly it and it flies itself. I mean, these things like for beginners, they work great uh, up into pros. I mean, once you, once you're in inspires, those things can really fly. So what kind of applications are you guys actually using your drones for? What kind of stuff are you shooting? Any interesting projects that you've actually shot with the drone? Well, I, I started with just shooting drone videos in itself. Uh, so I'll go to different locations uh, I love shooting on, on top of the water where you have boats kind of moving and stuff yeah. like that. Speed it up or, or, or slow it down in slow motion for certain shots. Uh, and then I've started vlogging myself personally and now weaving that as a part of the story as well where you can kind of have the location of where you're at and just have that overhead view. So what's... I'm sorry. So go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was going to ask about kind of the specs about the new one. What are you uh, excited about? What, what have you read? And, oh, man. Uh, what the, do you see? The 60 frame rate. I okay. mean, like with the slow motion that you can do with that insane and the night shots the quality of the imaging um right now with the p4 the image is great but it's not just it doesn't pop when you look at it uh so the night shots are really nice with the phantom 4 pro so if you're in an area where there's like lights in a city and you're like uh, looking at a distance you can capture a really nice image there and what what other drones have you had in your uh illustrious career so i've had the phantom uh phantom 3 uh it was standard that was my beginner into dji uh and then there's a phantom 4 uh, before that, I had some parrot ones that I would fly. And that's where I got my feet wet and crashed those things a lot. Um, but it, and then I have a lot of friends that have their, uh, they build their own drones. So for like racing and stuff like that. Uh, so I've done a little bit of flying with that. Um, I'm more, I fall more into the photography type of drone um, work than the racing and the obstacle kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about, uh, I mean, what will be your next drone when, when that uh, time comes? Man, I am looking at this uh, Mavic Pro because it's just so portable. I mean, you can take that place, you can take it, 
when you walk around with the Phantom Four, you kind of feel like a Ninja Turtle because you got this big backpack on it you. Is, it is big. But Even if you pull the props up, it's big. It's it big. Is. Yeah. yeah. But but it is an amazing. Uh, it's worth it, right? Yeah. Like you're gonna get an amazing shot with it, so it's worth carrying around. It's like dragging around an eight by ten camera. You know you're gonna get a good <laughs> picture with it, but yeah, you're hauling this thing around. You know? Exactly. Exactly. You get a workout out of it too. Uh, but the Mavic Pro, I mean that that thing looks amazing, and it just fits in such a small bag that you, you can, can actually take, take that on board at this point. I believe if you're Absolutely. flying. Right, that's that's yeah. So with the Phantom Four, you can bring that on United flights. You can't bring that on Delta flights. Oh, okay. Yeah, specific airlines have different rules. It comes down to the lithium batteries, and there's like certain things where you can wrap the batteries around, or like you can have it shipped under if you check it in. But United actually lets you put it in the overhead container. Mm, okay, know. that's that, that is good to know. Yeah, because yeah. that is a big issue. Absolutely. Batteries are problematic. So yeah. you were saying about DC and the and the fly zones. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, I understand why it's a little more problematic there. But what's uh, what's the specifics that you can tell us? So there's a 45 mile radius uh, outside of Reagan National, mm-hmm. and then Dulles, which is uh, not too far from Reston, has a five mile radius. So there's this small window of area in uh, the entire DC area is like Virginia, Maryland, and DC. It's just this like middle area they just call the DMV. So there's small pockets in the DMV that you can fly. I just happen to live in one of those pockets very luckily and then there's some areas around the Potomac that you can fly, but you have to be after Riverbend Park. But uh, you know, DJI has all that technology in there, so you don't have to worry about flying in an area that's a no-fly zone. Why? I mean, it, won't it won't allow you it to. It won't allow you to. No, that's one of the fly. neat things. It actually will avoid no-fly zones, which I think is pretty darn powerful technology. Yeah. Yeah. No, you want that. A lot of people... Will it not even turn on? I mean... In, it'll turn on, but it'll tell you, like, hey, you're in a no-fly zone right now. It's not going to take they off. Explode. They explode. Explode. <laughs> it just... They, <laughs> it seems fair. It seems fair. Right. <laughs> Where can we catch your, uh, your podcast? And, uh, what what channel work? is it on? Well, uh, if, you go, if you're going on iTunes, just go uh, search for YI Social. Five favorites drops on every Monday. And then uh, the latest episode of YI Social drops every Tuesday. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for dropping by. Thanks for having us. We finish up with an educational and entertaining chat with Parker Jokers from Propeller Heads. Parker has been building and flying drones for longer than most of us have even known about drones, and he's going to be sharing stories from his transition from a home builder to DJI user and speak on what still needs to be improved in his opinion. Okay, Parker is with Propeller Heads Aerial Photography, and you have experience with drones. Uh, bring us up to speed. Tell us a little bit about what you do and where you've been and how you use these little puppies. I was a Air Force combat photojournalist for 22 years, just retired in 2014. And before I got out, I started building um, custom tricopters and vehicles to lift cameras for our work in the Air Force and just look both ways over my shoulder and fly up, get my shot. Uh, This is all before the rules. This is when you could just kind of make sure the safety guy wasn't around and fly. (laughs) Um, Now I, I... Realized that um, you know I, it was it was definitely something I wanted to do more of, and so I started. Is, is it safe to assume you were doing this before, like DJI and all these companies oh, came to? So you were doing this when nobody else. Yeah, we were taking no commercial options. Yeah, we were taking apart uh, Nintendo Wii nunchucks <laughs> yeah. and using the gyros in them to make flight controllers. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Using Arduino boards to make little 8-bit flight controllers. And motors were inefficient. Batteries were terrible. Uh, everything was slow and dangerous. And it was awesome. Uh, <laughs> it, you had to be uh, the king of the nerds to be able to fly. Because the only person who could get the radios to talk to the flight controllers, to talk to the engines, to talk to the, to the, you know, the custom flash speed controllers that would talk to the, to the gimbals, to talk to the... And then you had to have a camera knowledge because you had to set the camera before you took off because you can't adjust it in flight. Um, so we would be building... Uh, you basically had to be king of the nerds. So you'd have... There's five or six guys on the East Coast when I started that, could, that even had the skill sets. There was no book. There was no club. There was no... There was a little bit of internet knowledge, but the learning curve was vertical because you'd go out in the backyard and it would start to try and eat your face and you go, okay, back to the lab. Let's try that again. Um, and it was a learning... It was a learning curve that involved some stitches and um, a lot of humiliation and we just got a little better every time and then we started doing it production-wise where we would lift cameras and we'd get 20% of our footage because the gimbals that we were using, the, eight mi- the 8-bit Alex Moss and uh, uh, boards that we were using were very finicky and they had to be... It was like getting... We used to call it getting all the witches in the coven to sing the same pitch. They all had to sing right at the same time because if they didn't, something was going to go... You're going to have a bad time. And then you had to know how to fix it on the job site. 
So we were building drones and we started getting better at that and we started building bigger drones. We've always been using DJI controllers. We started using 3DR stuff, uh, Pixhawks and uh, APM stuff. But it was even worse than getting the whole drone to work because you get out there and then one of the 19 systems would just not work and you like, it worked in the lab an hour ago. Now I, I can't use this for production because now I can't get my drone to take off. So this is BS. So we'd have to, we, we immediately switched over. I started using NASA flight controllers, which were the same flight controllers that were in the Phantom 1. And then the NASA Lite was the flight controller in the Phantom 1. And the NASA 2, the, v, the MV2 was the one that was in the, not the, flight, the uh, Phantom 2. So you could build a system with a pretty intelligent flight controller. At the time, they were fantastic. They were expensive, but they, they worked really well. And we started building drones around those, and they kept getting bigger and bigger. And then we went to Wukongs and A2s and stuff like that. And then the Inspire came out. And overnight, the calls dried up. People didn't want to spend $12,000 on a fully turnkey hand-built drone system that had a 32-bit flight control, 32-bit gimbal controller, and then you know multiple camera inputs and outputs and HDMI down and all these systems. We had to be radio specialists and motor power energy specialists and figure out how to get the power to the, the right kind of motors and right power. And you know, It got tough. I started out on slow sticks, foam wings with a carbon fiber stick down the center and one engine, and it was a $200 way to go out and have some fun. And then my buddy goes, you need to get into the drone business and uh, you need to try these drones. I'm like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. How much is it? He goes, well, that's $500. Like, you need to get bent. I'm going to go back to my slow stick. And he goes, now watch what it'll do. And you put a GoPro on it. And I'm like, oh, oh no. Oh no. Now I have to do that. <laughs> As a photographer, it was always about getting a different shot. Well, no one was using that. I couldn't right. rent a helicopter. The Air Force wouldn't give me one. I tried. I asked. So I had to build them for the Air Force <laughs> and go out to our camps and shoot photos from the air of our camps. And they'd see this thing fly overhead and they go, oh, it's just jokers. Okay, we're cool. Um, <laughs> and so the DJI Inspire came out and suddenly overnight, I was like, that's, a, that's an adorable toy you got there, dude. And I borrowed a friend of mine. Uh, used it for a little bit. I thought it was pretty cool. I thought it was a toy because the camera was a lower sensor quality and I thought that's this is gonna be this is gonna be something that someone who wants to, you know, daddy's money is gonna buy him their new first drone and you're not gonna have to do it's any of the work. It, it's not real. You're not a drone pilot. You don't know anything about it. And then I had a flight controller failure on my drone and it smashed into a parking lot. Which is why you never fly over people, by the way. Um, smashed into a parking lot and was destroyed three days before a DOD event that I had. I had to do a workshop, a military workshop. And I borrowed his Inspire and I took it to California with me and we thrashed this drone for a week. We flew it through doorways, we chased horses, we shoot, flew up a mountain, we flew after trains, we did all kinds of crazy stuff. I flew up against a wind turbine. This is all before it was, you know, Yes, it was all before we, we knew what we were supposed to be doing. In that. Before the rules before were laid the down. Rules, before the <laughs> rules. We were, we were renegades, and it was awesome. But <laughs> those days are long gone. Um, but I came home, and he goes, what did you think of the drone? I said, how much did you pay for it? It was 2800 bucks. I wrote him a check right there on the spot. I gave him the money. He never saw his drone again. I never gave it back. Uh, it was a, I, was, I made the sacrifices with the X3 camera for the sensor size because the client would look at the work. We had our pro-grade drone, which had a battery box, a drone radio box. The, the, the props had to be put on. The camera had to be balanced and gimbled, uh, gimbled in for the beginning of the day. And then we'd get 50 to 70% of our footage right at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, we'd go, here's our work. And it had to be color corrected and processed and it was need to be motion stabilized. And the client would go, cool. And then we had an engine problem. We had an ESC failure. It ended up being the same problem that caused us to have that drone failure. Um, there was a power issue somewhere in there, and we didn't realize it until it was a total loss. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, never fly over people. And so that's we... That's the second time that's mentioned. That's very it's very important. important. It's very, very important. important. No joke. Because you can kill somebody with one of these yes. things. We have a perfect safety record. We're very proud of that because we always follow these rules. But um, we flew like an entire day at this pharmaceutical factory. We were flying half a kilometer away up the road to shoot this amazing footage. We'd come down and we were really proud of what we got. And then we ended up needing to go to the Inspire for like two shots at the end of the day. And they were like, this is amazing. And I was like, but it's, but it, but it, but it's a toy. It's just, no, 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 but it this thing, this is so much cooler. I'm like, no, this footage is amazing. And I looked at my cameraman and he looked at me and he goes, we have some choices to make. And after that workshop, I got to really get into it. And I came home and I was like, uh, we're going to have to accept the sacrifice in the camera quality because this is, it, it is flawless out of the box. The gimbal is incredibly good. I've never, I, I flew through every weather condition, day, night, uh, in the, over water, in, in, you know, in high winds, super high heat. It, it told me everything I needed to know. 
on a, on a drone that you build yourself, you get this one blinking light. And at distance, you're like, does that mean compass? Or GPS just went offline? Or I don't know what that means. Um, I'm scared. Now I just look down at my screen and it goes, compass error, or battery temperature too low, or all of the hundred different things that it'll measure and monitor and watch for you. And it be, it, we came home and I had a little conference call with a couple of other photographers that shoot drones with me. And I said, guys, it's time to stop measure baiting and start worrying about our art again. It's time to stop looking at the specs of a system and start using it for what we're there to do, which is gather beautiful footage. And the Inspire lets us do that. And I think we should go to that system and go and I think we should buy into their ecosystem. And we never look back. Overnight, our build business basically dried up because everyone else had the same idea. No one's going to buy a $15,000 drone when for 2,800 bucks you can get an Inspire that is ready in 30 seconds. Uh, we ended up with four of them. Uh, I have a Matrice 600. I've had a couple of Phantoms. I keep getting them secondhand from people, so we spray paint in black and use them for drone combat. But um, <laughs> I still have a little chip on my shoulder about the Phantom. But, <laughs> but now, right out of the box, you can buy, for $1,500, you can buy more technology than I have dreamed of up to six months ago. And it works. And it works immensely it works every time. It works anywhere. It works at, in conditions that would ground anyone else. It works with such a level of integration with your computer system in front of you that you know every bit of information available to you. You have imagery that is better than what I'm flying on my Inspire 1. Better ISO, better quality, better codecs, better color correction. It's insane what you can get for $1,500 right now. And uh, it is... It is changing the way that I look at my job. It has gone from, I need to buy the most advanced to stay ahead to, I have gear that's so good that it lasts me a lot longer now. So I can hold on to a Phantom 4 Pro for a good two, three years, and it's gonna be viable for a good amount of time. So it's worth my investment. I do a lot of building inspections. If I need to get up close to a vehicle, or to a building, to shoot a wall at 18 stories up, the Phantom 4 is not only gonna be able to see the building in front of it, it's gonna be able to see the balconies to the side of it. So I don't run into something if the wind kicks me. Right. So right, I right. can be safer as a pilot. I don't have to worry about the piloting, which I know how to do. So it, it's good when things go wrong, but right now I'm a photographer. I wanna be able to do my job. If I'm going, oh, I don't know what's going on, then I'm not working my job, I'm worrying about my drone. So now I don't have to worry about my drone anymore. On an Inspire, when you pop off, on Inspire 1, when you pop off the throttle and you reverse it, it sinks just a little bit, maybe an inch or two. But on the camera, when you're doing a tracking shot and you reverse that direction, you try and take out that speed, you're gonna dip a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the Mavic, the Phantom 4 and the Inspire 2, it's got a new management system that much more rapidly adjusts the power through its transition, so it doesn't sink a millimeter. So it's, a, it's like being on a rail. It's like being on a dolly that just, you just, someone just grabs a dolly and stops it. As far as the camera's concerned, the platform could not be more stable. That's incredibly important for a professional. He needs to be able to get that camera where he needs to be and he needs to stay there until he wants it to go somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. And the Inspire 2 and the Phantom 4 are like they're on poles. It's almost, it's, they're almost organic. It's almost animalistic. It's just, it's like, the, it's alive. You it take off and it just thinks. You can see it reacting faster than you can even see it being moved. And you just realize that there's so much computing power involved now. That's the major difference now in new drones. Is before it was, you'd have to get the latest technology and integrate it all together to make it, to do what you needed to do. And it was always a story of compromises. You could never lift as much sensor as you wanted. You could never get as much control as you needed. And now I am able to do what I need to do with no compromises. I don't have to worry about, get, just, just if I had a better camera. The X5S is amazing. If I could just go a little faster, the Inspire 2 goes 67 miles an hour. If I could just fly when it was cold out, it's got onboard battery heating. If I could just get a little closer and not have to worry at that distance, it's got sensors on the top and front of it so that I could, don't hit a ceiling. I, don't go, I do indoor work all the time. If I can keep it from hitting a ceiling, don't worry, don't worry about it, guys. It'll stop when it gets there. Now, do you never, tr you never trust a safety sensor. It's always there to save you, not, not be there your guide. But sooner or later, you're going to have a bad time, and the drone is going to keep you out of it. Um, it's stuff like that that, as a pro, I, I say to myself, I can't afford not to evolve my ecosystem to the next generation because it, it, what was amazing two years ago now is something we couldn't even imagine. What I was going to say is, is we started out as a 
as uh, uh, people who were really on top of the latest technology in the hardware world. Better, more efficient motors, smarter speed controllers, flight controllers, lighter frames, and now it's all software. It's all integration with software systems. It's all, the batteries are smart, they talk to the computers, the cameras are intelligent, they control through the links. Everything now is done through software. So, you know, I say DJI is a, is a software company with a drone problem. Because, <laughs> because they- Interesting point. Well, they're yeah. essentially, they're essentially, it's all being delivered to us. The tap fly, the, tr the motion, the smart, the deep learning for tracking, the, the better camera processing, the, you know, they're, they're such a purveyor. They use so much media that they actually had a partnership. They have a partnership with Seagate now. They go through so much solid state media. They are doing things on a scale that a home builder like me could never even dream of. And so they've got 1,000, 1,400 engineers in their company, and each one of them is smarter than I am. So I, when they come out with something every six months, you just go, where do they get these wonderful ideas? Because it's the simple, it's the tiny things. Like the Inspire 1 had an HDMI mini output on the back of it. Great idea, but they had room for a full-size one, and the mini adapter was always flaky, and the mini plug itself had all that weight hanging on it, and the plug came out vertically, and then the cable was hanging off this tiny little thin yeah, plug. Yeah, 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 yeah. So on the new one, they put a full-size HDMI jack because it needed to be, it was something that was a little niggling problem. I never thought of telling them about it, but someone thought this could be better, and everyone uses full-size HDMI cables. So now when you're on a shoot and you, the director hands you his cable, you don't have to go run off and get your adapter anymore. It's stuff like that. If you if you're able to em, employ one improvement into what's there right now, what do you feel is lacking? Batteries. Ah, okay. Instant answer. Uh, I saw some technology at the Interdrone conference last year that had me so excited I was calling my friends and sending them pictures. Uh, there was a drone there that had a power source the size of a paintball tank. Uh, and it flew for two and a half hours. Oh, wow. I did Really? Fuel cell. $1,000 a unit is what they think they're going to eventually be able to sell it for. It's going to be out in about a year. And, and the selling, weight is? Ooh. The weight is comparable because you have a much higher energy density. So you're getting more energy from the weight you're lifting so you can keep the drone up longer. Batteries gotcha. are heavy. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So you get the right, energy yeah. dense and they're expensive. They're volatile. They're hard to ship. They're hard to transport. They're temperature sensitive. Or you can just go to the gas supplier when you get to your job and get a tank and fly a drone, you can fly it for, you can fly it for two and a half hours on a paintball tank, and then just go for 10 seconds and refill it and go fly again for another two and a half hours. And this was on a Matrice 100. So it wasn't a tiny little drone. And it gets better with scale the larger you get because you can lift a bigger tank. Right, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So we're gonna have persistent stare on drones that can go four or five hours someday. It's gonna change the way we deal with drones. I'm not gonna have to take my box of drone and my box of batteries which have to be kept in my house and at a certain temperature. I have a cooler in my truck. I put hot water bottles in and I keep my batteries warm because on a cold winter day, I put them in the drone and I just start counting. If the drone batteries get below 15C on a Matrice, it won't take off, which is why the onboard battery heating on the Inspire is amazing. If you live out in the mountains on the, on the West Coast and it's cold six months a year, you take that thing out into the hills and you don't have a way to keep the batteries warm, you're in a world of hurt. Now you don't have to worry about it. Parker, if people want to see the work that your company does, where should they go? We are located at propheadsphoto.com, and uh, our company is Propeller Heads Aero Photography. We're actually out of Middletown, New York. We're about an hour and a half out of the city. We do work all over the East Coast. Cool. Great. Wonderful talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much to everyone who sat with us at the DJI event. Don't forget to contact us at podcast at bhphoto.com or tweet us with the hashtag bhphotopodcast. But before we sign off, if you're going to be picking up the Mavic Pro on the B&H website, be sure to enter promo code BHPODCAST at the checkout to receive a 50% discount on the DJI Refresh one-year protection plan for the Mavic Pro and a free pair of quick release folding propellers for the Mavic. Check the podcast landing page for links to these products. And again, the code is BH Podcast and it's valid only for one week. And that's from March 2nd to March 9th, 2017. On behalf of Jason Tables, John Harris, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today. 